under the leadership of King Asa, there was much prosperity in the kingdom of Judah. They had rest from their enemies. There was a time and opportunity to build up this empire. And they did so physically. But what about spiritually? See, they utilized the opportunity to grow strong physically, but they did not do so spiritually. And how do we know this? Well, take out your Bible and look with me once more to the book of Second Chronicles and chapter 15. The book of Second Chronicles and chapter 15. We read in verse 3, And many days Israel was without a true God. Now, what does that mean? Well, it literally says a God of truth. They knew God that he existed. They would pray to him, but they did not know the truth of God, that he had doctrines that they needed to learn. And we see this is carried out in the next phrase. They did not have a God of truth, nor a teaching and instructing priests, and they were without the Torah. They were not growing in their knowledge of the laws of God, the commandments of God, the truth of God. And therefore, even though they grew physically more powerful, stronger in the things that brought about and earthly security. They did not grow spiritually to have a heavenly strength, a spiritual anointing that they needed in order to overcome the enemy. So this is their condition. But nevertheless, look now at at verse 4. When there was trouble to him, and that could mean the king or the people. When the people had trouble, they turned unto the Lord, the God of Israel, and they sought him, and because they sought him, they found him. He found them out in their need. Verse 5. In those days, there was not peace for the one that went out and came back. Now, what this is saying is this. Even though God, in the midst of trouble, he was found by them, and he assisted them, there was a change. Remember, we saw that God gave rest to them. He placed his hand over them for 10 years. But they did not utilize that time wisely, spiritually. And therefore, the time of quietness, peace, was removed. They overcame the attacks of Ethiopia. And Ethiopia, we'll find, was not alone. They brought assistance. But nevertheless, God's faithfulness gave them victory. But notice what it says now. There was a change. One could not travel safely. Going out and coming back to the land, it was of great risk. And furthermore, it says, for there was much. And the word that is using here is an uprising, a disturbance, a word that's also related to to chaos. There were great problems, not just around Judah, but when we keep reading, it says, concerning all the dwellers in the countries. There was worldwide instability. There was problems. And the reason for this is that Israel, the covenant people of God, and in this situation specifically Judah, was not having a positive influence on their neighbors. They were concerned about their neighbors. They were not being that light to the nations. All they were doing was utilizing 
the blessings of God for physical gain. They were unconcerned about spiritual truth. And therefore, the land, and I mean the entire world, began to suffer. Look now to verse 6. Nation would crush nation, and city would do so against city. For God was, and this is a word, for he was moving. God was bringing this, this, this instability, this conflict, allowing it because he was removing his presence because Judah, the people of God, were not faithful. You see, when God's people are faithful to him and they are having an influence around them, it impacts the entire world. But when God's covenant people move away from him uninterested in growing spiritually, it has an adverse effect upon the world. So God was bringing disturbance into the world through trouble. Verse 7. In the midst of this, we see something. There was counsel. Verse 7. You, speaking to the Jewish people, he says, you be strong and do not literally let your hands become loose. Now, this is a Hebrew idiom for becoming careless or simply giving up. Thinking when you look at the world and how it's a bad place. There's crime, there's hardship, there's war, there's famine, all these things. The tendency is to say, what can we do about it? But with God, all things are possible. So we hear here the revelation. Do not, he says, do not give up, rather be strong. For there is, and the word is schar. Schar is a, an outcome, a result, a reward. There is going to be an outcome, a reward for your activity. The things that you do in spiritual faithfulness. God takes whatever is faithful and he can add to it. He can grow it. He multiplies it, and he does so when his people are walking in obedience. God will do great things through even one faithful man. We've seen this with King Asa, but what's going to happen? Keep reading. Verse 8, And when Asa heard these things, and the prophecy, the prophecy of Oded, the prophet. Now, this is probably Ben Oded. We're talking about the same prophet, Azar Yahu. He's the one that is speaking, encouraging the people. Don't give up. Be strong. For there is going to be an outcome, a good outcome, a reward for all your service. He says, be strong, and he was. The king heard this, and he removed the abominations, those things that were unclean from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he captured from Ephraim. Now, we're talking about Judah, but Ephraim was part of the northern kingdom. So the nation of Judah was expanding. It was growing at this time, spiritually and also in, in land, acquiring land. And what else? He renewed the altar of the Lord, which was before the, the hall of the Lord, referring to the temple area. And he gathered all of Judah and Benjamin and also the the Garim. Now, this is those who dwelled in Judah with the Jewish people from Ephraim 
and Manasseh and Shimon. Why was this? For they fell upon him many from Israel in a great number. Why? When they saw that the Lord, his God, was with him, meaning this. Asa began to act faithfully, grow, put into practice biblically sound principles. And because of that, his kingdom expanded. And those who were part of that northern kingdom, they began to join. Why? Because they saw the Lord, the God Almighty, was with him. So we see again that it seems that Asa is doing marvelously. He is a faithful man. And now look, if you would, to verse verse 10. They gathered into Jerusalem in the third month. Now, the third month is the month of the festival called Shavuot or Pentecost. It is a festival that, that remembers the giving of the commandments of God in this time period. And they gathered there, and notice, they worshiped God in a generous way. Once more, verse 10. And they gathered to Jerusalem in the third month, in the 15th year of the rule of Asa. And they sacrificed unto the Lord in that day from the, the plunder that they brought. Now, this speaks about how they were prosperous financially, that God gave them victory over their enemies and they took the spoils of, of war. And what did they do with that? They didn't go to war for prosperity. They went to war for obedience to the purposes of God and they demonstrated that by taking the wealth of the other nations and they offered it up to the Lord. Not only that, they also gave from, from the cattle 700, 700 bulls, and also from the flock 7,000. And at that time, and this is all good news, it says, and they were brought into the covenant, a covenant to seek, this is the same word, lidrosh, with great commitment, and urgency, they sought the Lord, the God of their forefathers. Speaking again of the patriarchs, they were seeking the promises of God with all their heart and with all their soul. In other words, at this time, they were at a spiritual peak. Things were going exceedingly well, and they demanded an absolute commitment. There's a verse. Look with me to verse 13. They were serious. They did not want anyone who wasn't committed to the covenant of God among them. For all that would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel. What does it say? This one was put to death. Whether they be young or old, whether they be male or female. And the rest that survived, what did they do? Look at verse 14. And they made an oath. This is a word of promise, of commitment. They made an oath to the Lord in a great voice with the shout. This is a blast, the blast of the horns and the ram's horn, the shofar. And through it all, what did they have? Joy. Look at verse 15. And they rejoiced all of Judah concerning this oath, for with their heart they swore, and with all of their might they sought him. And he was found by them, and the Lord gave rest to them all around. Now, this is the second time in our study. They were victorious over 
Ethiopia. And another nation that joined with Ethiopia, Ethiopia that we'll see in a moment. God saw their commitment, their faithfulness, their dependence, and good things happened the first time and the second time. King Asa, from the time that he began to rule until now, he was a good king, faithful to the things of God. He brought about, for the second time, renewal among the people. Now let's go to our last chapter, chapter 16 in this book of Second Chronicles. Now remember the conference theme. Finishing faithfully. Not just doing the right thing for a while, for most of our life, but finishing, showing our faithfulness to God until the very end. See, Asa, he had been grown spiritually. He had seen one victory and another victory, but now, now was a big moment for him. And I don't believe that he realized the significance of what was about to happen. Oftentimes, victory and growth leads us up to a very critical time in our life. And this is what we see concerning King Asa. He was at a critical time in his rule. He was getting old. And he was going to soon turn over the kingdom of Judah, the holy city of Jerusalem, that, that temple. He was going to turn it over to another. And the question is, was he going to do that? Remaining faithful to the end, or was he not? It was a moment of truth. And notice how God is, is faithful. Look, if you would, to chapter 16 and verse 1. In the 36th year of the rule of Asa, went up, a man by the name of Basha, and he was the king of Israel. Now, realize something. After the death of Malach Shlomo, that is King Solomon, we all know this, the nation of Israel was divided. We see nine tribes made up the northern kingdom with most of the Levites, so almost 10 tribes. And the southern part of Israel, known as Judah, with Benjamin, we see that they made up the nation of Judah. And unfortunately, there was oftentimes conflict and bad feelings between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We see this, for example, in, in the prophecy of Isaiah, in the book of 2 Kings. And now we're going to see it once more in this book of 2 Chronicles. Because Basha, the king of Israel, it says that he did something. He went up concerning Judah. Now, going up, he didn't go up to worship in Jerusalem as he should. No, this king, Basha, went up to Jerusalem or went up to Judah in order to lay the foundation for going to war. It says that he built up there Ramah. Now, Ramah is where the prophet Samuel was from. It is exceedingly close to Jerusalem. When you are on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, you can learn, look westward and see Rama in a distance. The word Rama means lifted up. It is a, a city that was on the top of a mountain. And therefore, it was very strategic 
militarily. One, if he was going to want to take Jerusalem, it would be very good. It would be strategic to also have Ramah. If you controlled Ramah, you saw all the land around Jerusalem and Judah. Having controlling the high places was very important. So King Basha, this is what he did. He built up this place, Ramah. And he would not allow one to go out or come back. Meaning, he cut off Jerusalem and the cities around Jerusalem. They couldn't have commerce. They couldn't have business. They couldn't travel. And therefore, Jerusalem and Judah fiscally became strangled out and the prosperity that was built up over the years began to dwindle, decrease at a rapid pace. So what did Asa do? Well, what should he have done? Remember the words of that, that prophet, Azar Yahu. If you, you seek God, he will be found. God will be with the one who is with God. But if you abandon God, he will abandon you. Now, Asa, he had a testimony of trusting in God, being dependent upon him. But what happened here? Well, you see, having that northern kingdom, the nation of Israel, those other nine plus tribes against him, he felt very intimidated. But instead of trusting God, what did he do? Notice what the text says. Look with me, if you would, to verse 2. We read here. And Asa brought out silver and gold from the treasury of the house of the Lord, that is the temple, and from the house of the king. And he sent it to Ben Hadad, the king of Aram. Now, this would be Syria of today. The one who dwelt in Damascus, that's the capital of Syria. And what did this Asa do, the king of Judah? He spoke to the king of Syria and he said, basically, let there be a covenant between me and between you. Between my father, meaning my dynasty, and your dynasty, your father. Behold, I have sent to you silver and gold. And what was this? It was a bribe. He took money that belonged to the Lord in the treasury of the house of God, the temple. He took his own money and he gave it to an enemy. An idol worshiper, the king of Syria, Ben Hadad. Why? Because he was trusting in him rather than in God. He was trying to break this coalition, this agreement, this covenant between the king of Israel, Basha, and the king of Syria. And he thought because, and here's the principle, learn this, it is vital. You see, because of Asa's faithfulness, he received prosperity. The temple treasury, his own household was exceedingly, exceedingly wealthy. And therefore, he began to rely upon money rather than upon the Lord God and God's faithfulness, God's promises, God's word. So he said, let's have a covenant between me and you, my dynasty and your dynasty. And he sent gold and silver to Ben Hadad. And he says, go and break the treaty, the word covenant, with Basha, the king of Israel. 
that he will go up from me. He wanted Basha, the king of Israel, to go back to Samaria, to leave Ramah, so that there would be no threat. He trusted in a pagan man, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria in Damascus, rather than trusting in the power, the promises, and the purposes of the God of Israel. And this is because wealth, he saw what wealth could do in the world rather than what God had done in bringing him this wealth. His heart was turned to his physical resources rather than relying upon the greatest resource, God Almighty. So look, if you would, to verse 14. Verse 4, excuse me. And when Ben-Hadad, the king, heard of this, heard of King Asa, what he wanted, he sent, and we see here, that he sent and broke this treaty and removed the support that Basha was, was having. So Ben-Hadad received the bribe. He removed his support, and because of that, we see later on that Basha, the king of Israel, he withdrew. He departed. And when he did, we see something. We see that King Asa went and he built up what, what Basha started in Ramah. What don't we read about? Repentance. Turning to God, trusting in God, praying to God, relying upon Him. None of that. In his old age, King Asa trusted in wealth rather than seeking the promises of God. Now let's drop down to verse, verse 7. At that time came, now this is the second time a, a prophet came with a message from the Lord. And this prophet, look again at verse 7. This prophet was named Hanani. It is a word of, of grace. It's related to the concept of supplication, which is seeking God's grace. And God's grace is for the purpose of accomplishing His will. And this one is known as a roe, which is like a seer or one who, who sees visions, speaks based upon the revelation, the revelation that, that, that God gave to, to him. So he came to Asa, the king of Judah, and he said to him, in that you have relied upon the king of Syria, Aram, and not relied upon the Lord your God, Asa made a foolish decision to trust in man and not God. Therefore, notice the consequences. He says, the king of Aram has escaped your hand. Now, what's the message? Hanani is saying something. If you would have trusted in me, the Lord God, God would not only brought about victory and thwarted the purposes of Basha, the king of Israel, but you would also have been victorious over Aram, Syria, you would have had a great victory. Not just a return back to what it was, but this was an opportunity to grow your empire, your nation, the king of Judah, in a greater way. But you see, he wasn't thinking about the purposes, the plans of God. He was thinking about one thing, and that is physical security and therefore he made a decision based upon the physical and not 
the spiritual. Then Hanani said something. See, one of the things that God does is this. God grows us up. He matures us. And he gives us victories. When we trust in him, he responds. Remember the the Ethiopian war? Notice what it says in verse 8. Was it not the Ethiopians and, and here's more revelation. Not only did the Ethiopians come, but also Luvim. What's that? Libya of today. These two nations joined together to fight him. And they were an army, a vast army of chariots and horsemen. And then we have the phrase, Le Harbe Meod, which is to a great, exceedingly multitude. This was a massive army that came against Asa. But God moved. Miraculously, supernaturally, God sent a plague. And the Ethiopians, and now we learn the Libyans, they were forced back. And in the end, we see that Asa profited both spiritually and financially from this victory. But he forgot this truth. He forgot to depend and rely upon God. He says, "And but if you would have relied upon the Lord, he would have given them. But because you relied upon the Lord, he gave them into your hand. So he reminds him, you trusted once and God proved himself to be faithful. Now look at verse 9. In verse 9, we see something, another spiritual principle that you and I must learn. Notice what it says, and this is still Hanani, the, the prophet, the one who God gives visions to. It says here, for the Lord, his eyes go to and from in all the earth. Now, this promise is not just to Jewish people. It is to all humanity. God's eyes go all over his creation, looking for one who has a heart that is completely given over to God. He says, this is what God does. But you, look at the middle of verse 9, but you have acted foolishly in this. Now, this word for foolishly, relates to looking at things with human intelligence, making a decision that has spiritual implications and forgetting the spiritual, only looking at it from a human perspective. And that's when we do that. Notice what he says. You have acted foolishly concerning this. For from now on, instead of knowing that that sheket, that peace, that quietness, that tranquility that God gave to him to show his love, to show his sovereignty to Asa. Those 10 years, he says, because you have acted foolishly, now, from now on, there will be with you war. Not good news, not what a king wants to hear. Now, what should have King Asa, the king of Judah, done? He should have humbled himself. He should have repented. He should have confessed his sin. He should have sought God's forgiveness. But he didn't. He allowed these words of judgment, of discipline, of punishment, to cause him to become angry with God. Never be angry with God. All those things that that naturally make us angry, disappointed, whatever it may be spiritually, they all come from our own disobedience. Learn another principle. Don't blame God for the disobedience of men. 
whether that's your disobedience or someone else. God does everything perfectly, righteously. Whenever there's something bad in this world, it is because of disobedience to the things of God. Now, God may discipline. He may bring destruction. His wrath might fall, but the source of that, the cause of it, is man and not God. Look at verse 10. We read here, And Asa, he was angry with the, the man who had this vision. And what did he do? It says he set him in, now your Bible probably says prison. And that's true, but there's a very specific word, an unusual word that describes this prison. It is not a normal prison. But if you look at this word, it's a phrase, and it's bet ha ma pechet. Now, it comes from the word lefok, which means to change. And this was a special place within prison where one was put in stocks, that is, in bonds, and it was very, very, very uncomfortable it was exceedingly painful and the purpose of that was to cause that person to change to recant to confess to do what the one who put him in prison wants him to do so king asa took a man of god one who sees the visions that god gives to him Hanani. And Hanani was faithful. He spoke the truth of God. And where did he wind up? He wound up, not just in prison, but in a torturous state. And there we read, for the anger was with him on account of this. And therefore he, he moved against he destroyed, this is Asa destroyed from the people, some of the people at that time. Now, we're coming to the end of our conference. And what we see here is that, that Asa, he's coming to the end of his reign, and notice what it says in verse 12. In verse 12, Asa, he became sick, in the 39th year of his rule. Now, this all began, this problem with, with Basha and Ben-Hadad in the 36th year. He was able to solve it, he thought, very quickly by just sending money, a bribe. And God gave him three years, very important, that number three, to reveal something. He gave him three years to repent, to seek forgiveness, to change. But he didn't. He was angry. He was bitter. He took out his anger upon some of the people of his kingdom. And we would be led to believe that Hanani, this faithful man of God, where is he? In prison. In these painful stocks where he is suffering greatly. And we read in verse 12, three years later, there's no change in King Asa. And therefore, in this 39th year of his administration, he becomes sick in his feet. There's a problem with the foundation, what he's standing on. He's not standing upon the truth of God. And this sickness goes on up upon him. Also, in his sickness, this has to do with his suffering. In this sickness, he did not seek the Lord. Now, there may be kind of a play on words here because the term for Jewish law, walking, in obedience with God is just that, the term 
Halicha, which is walking to walk with the Lord. King Asa, because of the condition of his feet, he couldn't walk. Oftentimes in the scripture, when one is lame, it's to show an inner spiritual problem of disobedience, of not seeking things from the right perspective. This is King Asa. He was so faithful for so long, but in the end, he did not finish faithfully. He did not seek the Lord, but rather it says he sought help from who? From physicians. Two years longer, he remained in this condition without repentance, without change. And it says in the 41st year of his administration, he died. He died in faithlessness. He died in an unrepentant state. He should have used whatever strength he had at that last moment and repented, confessed his sin, turned to the Lord with all of his heart as he had done previously. But he did not. And he finished as a failure. Let me close out our conference with this. It doesn't matter who I'm speaking to. You are either going to finish faithfully your life or you are going to finish as a spiritual failure. And here's the, the important truth. You decide. You decide. If you're wise and humble yourself, you turn away from your pride, you can find forgiveness. You can find another opportunity. God will move, He will restore, He will heal, and you will have that privilege, that joy of walking once more with the Lord. Don't be stubborn like King Asa. Don't become bitter. Don't take out your spiritual frustration upon others. But humble yourself. Do what we learn over and over in these three chapters. The wise one, the one that's going to know the success of the Lord, is going to be the one who trusts, depend, rely upon the Lord. And understand that he is a God of truth. And what a blessing it is to have a teaching priest. That, that one that was called by God to impart biblical truth. Well, I'll close with that. Thank you for joining our conference. Shalom from Israel.